A very good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, which we are organizing to celebrate the launch of the OUP Online Encyclopedia of EU Law. The Encyclopedia is an online resource published by Oxford University Press uh, alongside a set of other online encyclopedias, um, and it is supported by the College of Europe in a variety of ways. Um, the concept for the encyclopedia was initially conceived by Lawrence Gormley and Kai Purnagen, uh, and I joined as a co-founder uh, shortly after. Um, currently, Lawrence and I are the general editors, and Kai is the president of the advisory board. The encyclopedia um, went live, as we like to call it. This means that it became accessible to subscribers in August of last year. Uh, with the first 100 uh, entries in various areas of EU law. This by no means uh, means it is a complete and finished product. Uh, instead, it is uh, constantly growing, uh, dynamically developing, much like the EU legal order itself. Um, we hope to grow the content of the encyclopedia uh, by a tenfold of the original uh, 100 entries um, in the years to come. In that endeavor, we are supported by an excellent uh, team of editors uh, who are all leading authorities in EU law generally, but especially in the fields that they edit for the encyclopedia. And they in turn work with uh, a broad range of authors who write their the articles on the subject of their expertise for the encyclopedia. I know uh, many editors, many authors are in the digital audience today. Uh, we are, of course, extremely grateful for all the work that they have done and continue to do, as without them, there wouldn't be any content. Now, of course, the subject of this webinar is not the encyclopedia as such. We hope to draw some attention to it, to advertise it a little bit with this event, um, but we didn't think it was appropriate to be talking uh, for, about the encyclopedia as such uh, for two and a half hours. Instead, um, we thought it might be a nice occasion to reflect on some issues, some challenges that we encountered uh, when creating and managing this, this product, this project, that we think are uh, transversal, probably, to our discipline, to the study and practice of EU law. Um, questions such as the feasibility and desirability of, of what degree of coherence and uh, comprehensiveness um, in the face of an ever complex, ever more diverse European Union legal order, um, as well as the, the impact uh, in positive and negative ways of digitalization on our discipline. Of course, we are an online encyclopedia, so we firmly believe and the opportunities that these developments bring. But of course, it's also interesting to reflect on some of the challenges uh, that digitalization poses for the study, the teaching, the, the, the research and the practice of EU law. Um, so we are absolutely delighted to be joined by a stellar lineup of speakers um, to discuss these themes with us. Um, the speakers are all members of our advisory board for which we are very grateful to them. Um, and they will be discussing with our very prominent panel uh, on the themes uh, of, uh, uh, of the webinar today. But I will now uh, pass the floor to Lawrence Gormley uh, to say a little bit more about that. Lawrence, go ahead. I, I was just saying welcome to everybody and thank you for uh, part participating uh, as, as speakers and, or uh, uh, listening. Um, uh, Sasha uh, gave a wonderful introduction, but I think it's appropriate simply to put on record that, frankly, the encyclopedia would not have got off the ground without Sasha's drive and initiative and commitment. And we're very, very grateful to her for everything that she's done and also to the college for putting its resources um, to, to help uh, get uh, the encyclopedia off the ground. My um, agreeable task, one of the nice things about being an emeritus professor is, as Gordon Slim used to say, you don't teach, you lecture, um, is really to introduce the uh, speakers. Shouldn't need much of an introduction, but nevertheless. Uh, Judge Marek Safran, uh, Safran uh, had a very distinguished career in academia at the University of Warsaw, 
and also was uh, a judge um, uh, previously at the Co Polish Constitutional Court. And he became a judge at the Court of Justice on the 7th of October 2009, was currently president of the 8th Chamber. And Judge Paul Nihu, um, who has been a judge at the General Court since uh, September 2016, is also a professor at um, the Université Catholique de Louvain and is a former professor at the University in, uh, in Groningen, where I also work. His distinguished CV has a, a certain uh, American flavor, uh, having has an LLM from Harvard and is a member of New York Bar, and of course is uh, a Fulbright scholar um, uh, and uh, 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 both great friends and uh, great speakers to kick us off. So I'm going to um, give the floor um, to our two speakers. I think uh, Marek is going first, as I recall, but um, Paul, if I'm wrong, do please jump in. Marek, I think you would. You, you... Yes, if, if you wouldn't yeah. mind, I will jump in indeed. Oh, right, Paul, yes, please. Uh, we have discussed with Marek that to which I would like to, whom I would like to express my gratitude again for allowing me to speak in the first place. It's a pleasure for me and to, to uh, Paul. <laughs> Stop, thank yeah. you, Marek. So I will have to I have some commitments just after and then I will rejoin you. <clears throat> so I'd like to congratulate the whole team for the project and to uh, thank you for um, associating me to this. And you should be starting to see now the PowerPoint, I would imagine. And you see that the title, with no surprise, is Unity in Diversity. And I have added a word, which is processes. I think we have to pay a strict attention to the way um, we organize our processes within the European Union in order to achieve unity in diversity. Um, Sasha? All right, so I'll, I'll start already. The, um, so in terms of processes, yes, you can turn, thank you, very good. If you look at the political process, you see that there is this huge diversity within the population, which is progressively reduced to a number of people, which is managed, a number which is manageable in order to reach decisions. So among the populations, there are voters voting for parliament in the parliamentary commissions, and then possibly those representatives in the tree log with the representative to the commission and the council. So this huge diversity is progressively reduced, but taken over in fact, by the people there in order to represent them. Follow, following, please. The judicial process is not that different, in fact. You also have, at the level of the first instance, this huge diversity of situations, legal situations, factual situations, and then some appeal judges, and then the Supreme Courts, and then the constitutional judges reducing all this, but taking over this diversity in their reasoning, following? And the Court of Justice has taken the right position, has taken its position, its system in that system, um, allowing all these judges to raise questions to the Court of Justice to receive a unity in interpretation and application of EU law. So the political process, the judicial process have been organized in order to allow to take over this diversity. And the following, please. It's a work in progress, as a matter of fact. Following. Um, one dimension in which um, the work is in progress is who is allowed to talk to European judges, to EU judges. Of course, you know that um, the treaty, as well as the jurisprudence, have made sure that between even the first instance judges and the European Court of Justice, there would be no obstacle. Nobody would be able to impede a judge to address itself to the Court of Justice in order to obtain unity in the in, uh, application and in interpretation of EU law. Following? But the question remains. Um, when we're talking about direct applications, and I mentioned only 263 here, 
given the level of importance given to individuals, associations, and undertakings in our union? Is it right or not? Is it the right time or not to allow more to more to allow to a more a substantial extent to a, 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 a superior extent the population itself to go straight to the court? That's a work in progress. You see cases going one way, going another one, but that's that's uh, uh, something we have and, and we are working on. The following. There is still another. Uh, thing that I think we can make and we are making progress in, that's the composition of the instances which are there in order to work out this diversity to the top for unity. So I made some some uh, some investigation last year following. Um, trying to see what were what were the five um, hits? I say, not, not yet this one. <laughs> um, if you want to go back. Uh, so I was working on five entries. Let's let's leave it this way. Five entries. Okay, very good. Five entries to see, um, try to identify the member states which are the most involved um, for the Court of Justice in the different courts. Try to see um, the origin of the legal secretaries, the origin of the interns taken on, the origin of the visits at court the uh, nationality of the courts asking questions and the nationality from which direct applications emerge following. And surprisingly, I found this was before a large bunch, this was last year, so a large bunch of new questions arose in, in uh, I think in Bulgaria, particularly concerning the, the uh, um, rule of law. But before that, I saw that the five countries coming up the most often were founding members. And the ones in green were member states who had come up in the 80s, so in, this, in the third wave after the UK the, and, and Ireland, the third wave of enlargement. But, so the five, but I haven't seen any other state in, in these five top, in fact. And so I think our job now is to try to make sure that we involve as much as possible more of the countries for instance, in the general court, the president, uh, Marc van der Waard, has established a system in order to increase the capacity of legal secretaries from other uh, countries to, uh, to be able to function in the court, particularly with language courses, to, precisely to that effect. So there are two works in progress, but I think we're running, we're running uh, uh, a, good, a good exercise currently. Thank you so much, and thank you, Sasha, for running the show. Thanks. Thanks very, very much indeed, Paul. Um, I, I think the the best thing is we, we give the floor to to Marek. No, okay. No, no, no. It's good. Yes. Fantastic. Thank, thank you very, excuse me. Excuse me. Thank, thank you very much for for, for invitation and uh, I, I would like to express my my congratulations uh, of the editor uh, for for initiative uh, this uh, wonderful uh, encyclopedia. Uh, I would like to, to, to share with you some some reflection, uh, perhaps more general, uh, uh, about unity and diversity and uh, um, about the linguistic diversity. Uh, the essence of the European Union, of course, the constant clash of uh, unity and diversity. Uh, I must point out uh, from the start that uh, the language of the European Union is uh, uh, one. It is language of law. Uh, with this assumption in mind, uh, I will like to refer the concept of this speech. Uh, I will primarily talk about the European Union permeated by both unity and diversity within the framework defined by the language of law. Uh, I will begin with a few general uh, observations. Diversity and unity are both a great advantage, but uh, uh, a certain weakness. Uh, Europe was built from the beginning of the foundation of unity and diversity. On the one hand, member states represent a strong historically, historically shaped culture and tradition, the diversity of language and customs. Why, on the other hand, our particular culture drew inspiration from common source of the Greek philosophy, 
Christianity and Roman law. This uh, combination of unity and diversity determined the shape, concept, and constitutional architecture of European Union. On the one hand, the Union represents the community components that bind us together. On the other hand, the member states, which, uh, upon joining the Union, do not lose their sovereignty but agree to its limitation. The history of European integration is a process of constant adaptation uh, and the adjustment of these two components, a dynamic and never ending process with phases of andante moderato, allegro forte, and uh, counterpoint. A fascinating process because, at first glance, it seems impossible, yet it is consistently taking place. Um, this inherent uh, uh, dynamic of this process means that neither the creators, the founding fathers of the European community idea, nor its uh, contemporary participants uh, can precisely answer the question uh, of uh, what is the ultimate goal. The creation of federal organism, a union of states bound by the mechanism of confederation, or particular uh, hybrids, uh, eclectic structure that leaves room for sovereign state organism. We do not have to, and indeed we are not able, of course, to, to answer this question today. I can only formulate a hypothesis that European integration is taking place within not entirely defined limits, but it has a clearly defined direction, starting from economic integration today, is increasingly moving toward expanding the area of political integration, also its future shape remains undefined. Regardless of the closer or, or, or more distant result of this process, one thing seems certain, an inalienable characteristic of union, both today and in Staten Ascendi, will remain the constant tension between unity and diversity as it is the driving force behind its development. I have my own personal vision of European Union in which uh, uh, the entire sphere of political mechanism uh, is covered by the community and uh, the rest remains the domain of linguistic, culture, edu educational um, uh, diversity. Possibly, I deliberately uh, put the question mark, mainly based on local and regional communities are created uh, according uh, to other unifying criteria. I cannot rule uh, out that uh, this is completely utopian vision, uh, constituting a dream rather than an element of pragmatic and rational thinking, because it requires a thorough re revaluation of the concept of the state and national identity. But from the very beginning, the idea of European community was built on the basis of thinking uh, permeated with uh, daydreaming rather than pragmatism, and yet it uh, managed to uh, achieve much more than seems possible at the starting point. The linguistic pluralism of the European Union is an integral part of it, expressing both unity and diversity. It represents a combination of the language of law uh, with the diversity of national, uh, national official languages. This linguistic diversity seems to be guarantee and condition for the European Union common coexistence. And therefore, it is not without justification to claim that language equality, clearly adopted in Council Regulation 158 uh, of July 1, 2014, holds the rank of constitutional principle. At the same time, it uh, constitutes uh, a significant factor in building a sense of belonging for citizens to the Union, ensuring that nobody takes away their identity, which is often closely tied to language. It is important to note uh, from this perspective that uh, in accordance uh, with Article 13, uh, to you, uh, a citizen may address in writing and uh, body or institution of the Union in any offic uh, official language. The importance of language equality 
is also confirmed by the well-known ECJ ruling uh, in the Scoma Lux case, December 11, 2007, stating that uh, obligations addressed to individual contained in the legal act of the union, which is not available uh, in the official language of given country, cannot be considered opposable uh, and therefore effectively enforced against citizens. In this sense, it can be concluded that linguistic pluralism is also condition, uh, condition for reaching uh, individuals with this message coming from EU law, uh, affirming, uh, the, uh, affirming the belief that these are our, that is our as EU citizens' rights and freedoms. I can say it with full conviction that uh, as a judge who was uh, the rapporteur for the first case uh, conducted in the Irish language, uh, the Gaelic language, uh, to be certain, of course, man maintaining uh, the pluralism comes at a cost, but it doesn't not create less clear, uh, insurmountable barrier, especially today with the increasingly widespread use of uh, uh, AI technique. Uh, this uh, technique do not eliminate, uh, of course, uh, the need for translator, as it uh, is uh, ultimately the responsibility to translate text into, uh, into the language of law. Since they are not, to be honest, uh, uh, translator in the strict sense, but uh, jurist language. We should also not exaggerate the language-related uh, problems associated with the existence of uh, uh, multiple, uh, sometimes inconsistent language version of Union Legal Act. I return here to my initial thesis. Within linguistic diversity, we seek a common, uniform um, meaning of the norms, and uh, thus, thus we try to establish a common European language of law. This is where the concept of autonomous legal order and the idea of autonomous concept originate, built not on textual uh, interpretation based on isolated language version, as uh, con confirmed uh, already by, by, by Stauder judgment of November 12, uh, 1969, but on theological and functional interpretation of the law aimed at determining the purpose of the norm at, uh, at the context in which it's placed, as expressly, expressly stated by the court in the ASCA Denmark judgment September uh, 26, uh, 2013. I might add that linguistic diversity is not a determinant for establish, uh, establishing the working language of the Court of Justice. Uh, this must uh, remain uniform, as it is a necessary tool for internal communication, consultations, and uh, exchange of notes and documents. Given the dominance of the English, uh, English language, I believe that maintaining French as the working language of the court is a good solution in line with the principle of preserving, as far as possible, diversity. What is the real problem of the European Union is not diversity of national languages, but communication between the common language of law. And uh, here are some examples. Today, there is a heated debate uh, uh, around the idea of identity, which often related exclusively to national uh, constitutional identity, is strongly opposed by uh, some to European identity. How often we hear the argument today and uh, it, has, uh, it has been particularly strong lately in relation to the rule of law dispute, that the competences of the European Union definitively end in the area covered by national identity. It is worth adding that the dispute itself is not worrying, uh, as it's evidence of the vitality, uh, the vitality of the idea that is a subject. Uh, what is troubling is that the dispute in some cases, that is in the case of the concept of identity, reaches deep and undermines the essence of what binds European Union together. 
namely the set of the most important values as indicated in Article 2 of CEU. At the same time, however, there is also a positive aspect of this dispute, as never before has the core set of these values and principles been so clearly and uh, vividly defined, setting the boundaries of potential conflicts, uh, delimiting the possibility of appealing the national identity. Before its famous conditionality judgment of February 22, 2022, the Court of Justice had never defined the concept of union identity as autonomous legal order built on the same fundamental values uh, so clearly. Conflicts and tension reflected in the case law of the Car uh, Court of Justice uh, of uh, EU uh, in the matters of some crucial concepts uh, of EU law and the very hard to find the common legal sense that is uniform legal language cannot be reduced to vertical disputes between EU law and national system. They rep represent the authentic and diverse axiological preferences of our pluralistic societies, uh, which are not organized along national lines, but according to one's position in social structure, age, profession, relationship to religion, etc. Today, all Europeans are faced with the need to make choices between our individual interests and the general interests represented by the entire society. The particularism and diversity of our personal needs and preferences must give a way to the need to find a compromise and to develop a consensus reflecting the common good. The demarcation line between the sphere of particular interest and the era where priority is given to the community is often the subject of fundamental controversies uh, which are clearly revealed by the ECJ case law in widely discussed cases in recent years, such as the clash uh, between privacy and personal data protection on one hand and the general interest related to the public security protection against crime and terrorist acts on the other. Uh, for example, the Quadratir Guinet, Watson, uh, Digital Rights, and many others. The more complex social structure becomes, the faster development of information technology accelerates, and the greater the value of individual autonomy and freedom to choose uh, our, our lifestyle, pressure to build a common area of compromise and community of the most important values increases. The risk of collision of interest grows proportionally to the need for communities focused on seeking compromise. It seems that the dispute between unity and diversity undergoes a peculiar universalization, transcending the borders of uh, individual systems and countries, and as a result, the Result, the, 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 the resolution of emerging dilemmas is possible only at universal general level rather than within individual legal order. The European Union, representing a community of values, while simultaneously taking into account diversity, is the appropriate, uh, appropriate forum for seeking such a solution. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so very much, Lawrence. I yes, th th thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I don't know if anyone wants to um, ask any questions, or if we're just going to proceed to the to the next speakers. I think we can proceed um, because the, the, pan the panelists can then, in in their section, yes. uh, engage with the the speakers. Yes. Marek and Paul, thank you very much indeed. It's um, now a, a great pleasure for me to um, go to the next our next two speakers. Um, uh, professor Anthony Arnold, Tony Arnold is the Emeritus Barber Professor of Jurisprudence at Birmingham Law School. 
and he's author of the uh, uh, classic and inspiring work, The General Principles of EU, EC, Law and the Individual, uh, and also the European Union's Court of Justice, and a very short introduction for Oxford, and also co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of European Union Law. He's also worked at the Court of Justice uh, as a referendaire in the past. And Professor Averika Tristaniak, who is prof a Professor of European Law in Austria and in Slovenia, and is a former judge at the General Court and was Africa General at the Court of Justice from 2006 to 2012. She's also a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, as well as an arbiter for the Vienna International Arbitration Center, um, two um, very distinguished and very uh, well-qualified and personable speakers. Um, and I, uh, I'm not too sure which of you, which of you is going first. Are you going first, Tony, or is or is or is, um, is uh, Verica? Thank you so much, Verica. If you go first. Okay, I don't know what was it, what was uh, anyway for me it's okay. So, but I have a PowerPoint presentation. I will try to. I hope I will succeed this uh, no, without uh, big problems. Oh, it says well you're trying to share context. Content. So we're getting. This I think we, you still see also part of my screen. That's uh, correct. Uh, I we see the desktop behind as well, but we also see your oh. slide well. But I will now move to a full presentation. Now it's okay. Perfect. And you can hear me. Yes, loud and clear. Indeed. Excellent. So then I will move. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation and also congratulations to editors. It's really something you know, but we we'll stay for the future. It's not only football players and all this, uh, what is in sport, but I think that we need science and we need uh, um, editors. And I congratulate the both to Oxford University Press and the College of Europe. Um, to start with a question, when we speak about the EU and about the case law of the European Court of Justice, um, what is negative? What is positive? What is your personal perception? It's this, uh, how to say, uh, case law uh, helps to unify European Union or case law, uh, how to say, lead to the problems, lead to withdrawal of the EU as we had problems with the Brexit. Uh, we have differences in the EU from languages, food, culture, but we have also differences in the in, in the area of law. We have different national legal system. We have different national le, uh, case law, and some other differences. But we have also, uh, how to say, many areas where we are unified. I think that for all of us to live in peace and to ensure the peace, this is something. But started already by Victor uh, Igo, you know, all this famous speech. Uh, that one day will come when all nations in our continent will form a European Brotherhood. I think this is something what uh, we have already today and I hope we will have for future. And we have common uh, and unified, uh, I would say, values like from rule of law, democracy, fundamental rights and so on. We have uh, uh, free economic freedoms from free trade movement of persons important for unified Europe. And we have, this is what I actually would like to stress, we have EU legal system and uh, we have also case law of the European Court of Justice. But now I think this is actually the most important slide. Uh, what is important? It's not important only that we have law, but we need implementation of the law in practice. If we have only law without written implementation, then this is not the rule of law. But it's also not enough that we have only implementation in the practice. We need also case law. We need courts to decide about the problems concerning the impl implementation of law. And very important, without enforcement, all these three stages are not important. We need at the end enforcement. We need a mechanism that the case law is then also realized. We have in the EU financial financial sanctions at the end, then after, for example, after infringement procedure against a member state, 
And this is something that is really important. We have seen these problems also with the European Court of Human Rights because that it's de facto, actually, I would say, or by the different uh, uh, arbitrations, no, no infringement, uh, sorry, no enforcement, sorry, no enforcement, realistic procedure, I would say. Uh, about the values, I know that we are sure, all sure that we have a common European values from rule of law, freedom, equality, democracy, fundamental rights, human dignity, all it's written in the article two of the Treaty of the European Union. But I would like to ask one question to maybe to, to make some doubts about this. Can the head of state be someone who is not a candidate for democratic election? I think that we all discuss this sometimes with our students. Why I would like to ask you this? Because as you, <laughs> we know that we have in the EU, we have monarchies and we have republics. And okay, republics are all new member states and some old and monarchies, some old member states. And then we, we discuss this with students. They sometimes are skeptical uh, about monarchies, and but always say these are modern modern monarchies. They respect the rule of law, and you cannot compare this with the old monarchies. So that this is just to show you these differences that we have also actually on the area of rule of law. There are also some cases of the European Court of Justice concerning the monarchies, or not monarchies, but concerning the titles of nobility, like case Ilunka von. Uh, Ilunka said Wittgenstein, uh, there was a problem with Austrian title of nobility because, as you know, in Austria, uh, titles of nobility are forbidden. But, for example, in uh, Germany, they are allowed and the both countries, both member states are republics. So that there are the differences and we need for to decide about this, we need court of justice. It is important. This is actually the, how to say, the aim of this last uh, slides, which I have presented, that the EU has to have the same standards for all member states. This is very, very important. I am a former judge and advocate general, general always loyal to the court uh, case law, but sometimes uh, as advocate general, I would not propose the same decision, decision but it was also when I was advocate general, the court, the court didn't follow me in all cases. So that what is important for uh, our legal, uh, actually, if I may say so, unity, uh, not only treaties and charter of fundamental rights, but also it is important that we have this uh, case law of the court of justice. I will show you on the, uh, what to say, on the, um, Okay, not on the case, on the uh, on the area of rule of law. Uh, for example, we have different, if uh, one member state does not respect the rule of law, then we have different infringement procedures. Uh, for example, against Poland, there are many infringement procedures very often uh, because of the, uh, in the area of uh, justice, because of um, judges' independency. And this is in connection with the Article 47 of the EU Charter, Judicial Rights and Independence of Judges. And this is then part, actually, we can say uh, just human rights and also this is part of rule of law or cases against Hungary. We know that, uh, for example, free, uh, freedom to association and this problem with uh, NGOs. Uh, finance from uh, other, uh, from non-member states, uh, non-EU member states, and then problem of freedom to association and Article 12 of the Charter. So that uh, we have this mechanism that the court, uh, that the Commission, European Commission can start a procedure, so to say, to keep rule of law on, the, on a very high level. And this is important. But then we have also, as we can see in the second part of this slide, very skeptical member states sometimes. It is okay, also Poland, I will not mention against now this uh, judgment, uh, to say, in, 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 uh, from the um, Polish court, the constitutional court, but we have also from in old, uh, uh, so-called old member states, you know, the problems with, with constitutional court in Germany. And these decisions uh, and, and, and decision about uh, um, how to say to simplify about the European Central Bank, a central bank, and this was also the first time that the um, European Court of Justice published uh, a press release concerning the <laughs> uh, how to say rule of law or 
so that the the Court of Justice, I think it was in May 2020, didn't say it is about the German Constitutional Court, but just say national courts, even national constitutional courts, you have to respect our case law. And this is important how to say the keep the rule of law on the uh, very high level in all EU member states. Yeah, this is this uh, decision against uh, Poland uh, infringement procedure. This is important. This is not preliminary ruling. But then just to mention these differences, I said already before, for example, in Austria, we have obligatory pension system uh, for judges. Uh, so that this is in German language, but just to show you these differences that we have in the EU, in Austria, when you when a, a judge has for uh, 65 years, has to be it's obligatory retired. So that I don't like to compare this with the Polish judgment because in Poland it was really um, how to say decided um, just to how to say <laughs> eliminate. I'm not sure if this is the correct word in English to eliminate some judges from the office. But anyway, we have to know that we have differences and that. Um, to keep this and um, uh, really always, uh, especially the Court of Justice and also European Commission, uh, especially European Commission, I would say, the same criteria for all member states. And now in this slide, just to mention, because I will finish and then in the next two minutes, um, just to mention here uh, some other areas where the Court of Justice try to unify the European Union. It's not only rule of law. Because rule of law, sometimes, you know, for the, how to say, for the average citizen, it's something very theoretical and not so, he's not so worried about this. But when you speak, up, speak about the common European currency, about about euro and about, about bank union, then we know that this is something that is support, important, I would say, directly for our economy. And there are different cases, not only this German case, wise, but also case uh, there was infringement procedure against Slovenia in the area of uh, uh, bank union concerning the archives of uh, European Central Bank and um, also the problem of national Slovenian sovereignty but uh, the, the court decided that Slovenia violates the EU law because the police entered the, to the national bank and took also emails from the Slovenian governor of the national bank and the court decided that also emails of the national banks are part of the archives of the European Central Bank. But this is everything just to keep, to unify Europe, to keep and to strong the bank union. All case, you know, from Latvia, Rimšević concerning the government of the National Central Bank. But then we have also other areas important, for example, consumer protection, case Kusionova, where the, the court by the interpretation of unfair terms in a consumer contract decided that we have right to home, right to accommodation, according to the Article 7 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Also important for unify, uh, to unify values in this area or many cases in the area environment, climate, sustainability, indirectly connected with uh, also future sustainability problems or, or, or aims like Commission versus Spain, uh, water pollution problems, and many other cases. But for me, one of the most interesting areas, because I have many speeches at the conferences in uh, last time uh, concerning the digital age and artificial intelligence, there are not only cases, uh, Google, uh, Schrems, and so on, about Google, about the right to be forgotten, Schrems cases one, two about the transfer of data to the United States, but also Uber, Airbnb, where we don't have actually EU regulations, but or uh, directives, but we have a case law of the European Court of Justice against uh, uh, to court ECJ tried to to, uh, to to keep the same standard, or in digital age important about the automated processing. The, uh, for example, credit scoring bank will not give you a credit because in a pre-evaluation pre uh, system, you were um, deleted from the list, if I may say so, uh, and these automated decisions are not obligatory according to the Article 22 of the GDPR, uh, General Data Protection Regulation. We will get a judgment in two months, I think, and uh, the problem also about data protection 
do we have non-material damage, non-material damage, be only because we feel unpleasant because something was, uh, how to say, uh, published. <laughs> um, uh, and this is also um, this legal basis we have in Article um, 82 of the GDPR. It's an Austrian case, and we will get judgment next week or in two weeks. Very important uh, if we have, in which cases we will have this the, this right in the future, so that important areas also on the area of digital age, but I think that in the next uh, next speakers are going to speak about this. Uh, and the, actually, last question, what is then our uh, future judges uh, in the area of digital law? Are we going to to need judge also? Um, I think we need the judge as a human being also in the future or we will have only robots. Uh, who will decide about rule of law in the future? I think that uh, the, we will always have judge as a human being because uh, judge robots will decide about the que technical question, but will never decide about this, what is justice? What is fair? What is proportional? I think this is something, but we, we uh, always keep for a, for a robot. For example, if we take rob, if we take this uh, divorce, who will decide about the divorce in the future? I think if two partners agree to divorce, this can be a decision of the of the uh, robot. But who will take care for the children? You know, the robot cannot decide about this because you uh, then you have to respect also um, empathy. Uh, emotions and so on, not only how high is salary or some technical questions. So that this is also something that the uh, digital age, age and digital era, it's something where also Court of Justice has very important role to unify this area and the standards. So that uh, court strives, strives to promote unity in case law, promotes the rule of law, but has to have same standard for all member states, promotes fundamental rights, and decided, uh, decides in very complex and important um, cases or questions uh, related to digital technology. And this is my last slide, I think, as I said at the beginning. It's very important that we have law imp uh, implementation and that we have case law, but we have also in the EU enforcement and with good and uh, case law of European Court of Justice, we can trust in our future in the search of legal unity and also to keep our uh, uh, Europe for future as it was Europe from Greek mythology, uh, so that it's always our continent has got name uh, on the basis on the Europe from Greek uh, mythology, and I hope this will be also our future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Verika. That's a uh, very stimulating contribution. Thank you. Um, Tony, the floor is yours. I think you're muted. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm going to say uh, a few words about uh, a, a range of subjects, starting with the, the most recent set of judicial statistics, where the ECJ drew attention to the effect on the court of the major issues confronting today's world. And it mentioned in particular the rule of law, the environment, the protection of privacy in the, in the digital era, and the war in Ukraine. And this provides, I think, a sober reminder, should it be needed, that the court is not immune from outside pressures. At the same time, the number of cases brought before the Court of Justice and the general court remains very high. And the court says that this represents a significant uh, and structural increase in the number of cases brought over the last five years, in particular before the Court of Justice. 
but the figures provide only part of the picture. The president of the ECJ, Kuhn Lennertz, has noted that the court is being increasingly called upon to decide sensitive matters. And he notes in particular the rule of law, environmental protection, combating discrimination, privacy and personal data, enforcing competition rules against what he calls digital giants, etc., etc. So to prevert, preserve its capacity to give high quality decisions within a reasonable time, the court submitted a request to the legislature in November 2022, seeking a transfer of jurisdiction to the general court to give preliminary rulings in certain areas and an extension of the mechanism for determining whether an appeal should be allowed against decisions of the general court. This promises to be a major innovation. The Court of Justice also notes an increasing number of cases raising sensitive and complex issues requiring greater reflection and time. This is being tackled through the increased use of orders, but there has nonetheless been a modest increase in the average duration of preliminary ruling proceedings. As for the General Court, an important recent development has been cases involving restrictive measures connected with the war in Ukraine. And these represented 11.4% of all new cases brought in 2022. I'd like now to turn, if I may, to a couple of striking decisions of the court. The first is Consortio Italian Management, a lengthy judgment in which the court revisited the famous Chilfit ruling of 1982. There is now a lengthy catalogue following Consortio of issues that national courts of last resort must consider. Two in particular stand out. Though it has to bear in mind possible divergences between the relevant language versions, a national court is not expected to examine all the language versions of the provision in question. And secondly, where a national court of last instance concludes that there is no reasonable doubt as to the correct interpretation of EU law, it may refrain from referring a question to the court and deal with the issue itself. This looks like a less invasive court, one which is willing to offer more leeway to national apex courts, and it will be interesting to see how the uh, situation develop, develops. The second case I'd like to draw attention to is Venezuela against Council. This interesting case raised the question whether an annulment action could be brought before the EU courts by a non-member state. In particular, could Venezuela be considered a legal person within the meaning of the fourth paragraph of Article 263 of the treaty? The court noted that certain legal persons could bring legal proceedings before the EU courts. This suggested to the court that no legal person should be deprived of the possibility of doing so. The term legal person was not in the view of the court to be interpreted strictly. Not only private legal persons, but also public entities could therefore bring annulment proceedings under Article 263. A third state, it said, should therefore be accorded standing to bring proceedings as a legal person within the meaning of that article. As a state with international legal personality, Venezuela therefore constituted 
a person all these days. This was a conclusion that apparently caused some consternation in the council. Finally, I'd like to draw attention to a recent contribution in the Journal de Droit Européen by our colleague Inge Govar, who identifies four challenges facing the court. First, she argues that the growing scope of EU law should prompt us to wonder what the main function of the court really is and whether it can feasibly continue to wear so many hats, constitutional, administrative and civil, at the same time. Secondly, she argues, the crucial dialogue with the constitutional courts seems more and more tenuous in certain member states. Thirdly, she points to a growing use of insta-institutional litigation as a way of resolving political issues as an alternative and finally she identifies the analytical nature which are linked to the rule of law. I wonder whether the institutions and the court are listening. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, that's uh, two very uh, stimulating uh, things to take us further. Um, I think we'll now pass to our next uh, a couple of speakers. And um, again, two uh, old friends. Um, first of all, Inge Govar, who's a, pr a professor of EU law and director of the Ghent uh, European Law Institute and also the uh, director of the LLMs at Kent University. She's also director of the European Legal Studies Department here at the College of Europe in Bruges. She's published widely on a range of issues with particular expertise in the internal market and external relations law. And with Sasha Garvin, she's co-edited a series of books on with heart publishing on the vision of competences, better regulation, the inter interface between EU and international law, constitutional democracy and the internal market 2.0. Uh, and she's speaking with uh, Professor Paul Nimitz. Paul is a principal advisor in the Director General at the Commission for Justice and Consumers. Before that, he was a director responsible for fundamental rights and union citizenship and was lead director for the GDPR, the Snowden follow-up and negotiations of the EU-US privacy shield and the EU Code of Conduct Against Hate Speech on the Internet. Before joining DG Justice, he worked in the Legal Service of the Commission and in the Cabinet of Commissioner Nielsen. He's also a Professor at the College of Europe and has committed the book with Inge and Sasha on constitutional democracy in the EU and has, of course, uh, uh, also a long list of other publications. So without more ado, I'm going to um uh, welcome you both and say thank you very much in advance for your willingness to speak to us and i'm not too sure i think is inga going first Sh shall we do that inga floor is, is that is fine with paul thank you very much uh lawrence uh the topic of our uh, intervention of Paul and I is the digital challenge to the study and practice of the EU. But before tackling that, I would like to congratulate Oxford University Press with this online encyclopedia, and in particular, of course, Lawrence and Sasha for the encyclopedia and also for having organized uh, this very interesting event. We share the same topic, Paul and I. Um, I uh, propose that I will focus more on the study of EU law, although my main argument will be that the study of EU law, of course, should be aligned to the practice of EU law, that you cannot have one without the other. Um, our task was to give some reflections on this, so not exhaustively, so that is uh, what I will comply to do. And I would uh, like to offer some reflections with respect to the study. Uh, of EU law and the digital challenges 
um, in three main headings, and I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, although we're talking about the digital, my apologies. Uh, I will first say something about the contextual changes that the study of EU law has known. Secondly, the objectives of the study of EU law. And thirdly, about the challenges as I see them uh, today, but which again, of course, may change in the future. So, first of all, the contextual uh, changes. We all know that the digital has taken on huge proportions today in our teaching, in our practice. Uh, however, this is still fairly recent. Um, the Information Society and its breakthrough in the study and practice of EU law, I think, can be situated somewhere in the 80s. I mean, of course, it was used before already on a more uh, small and uh, military scale and private scale. But I think the major breakthrough came in the late 80s. Um, and why am I mentioning this? It is because when we talk about education and study of EU law, you deal with the younger generation, generations that have uh, that were born into the digital age and that are very well acquainted with all the digital tools, whereas the professors may not necessarily have the same expertise and background. I remember, for instance, writing my PhD, studying uh, and doing my research. Uh, it was purely offline. We still had our filing system with our little cards. Uh, we did not have computers at the time of writing my PhD. We did by then have some form of computers, but without a hard disk. So I don't have to explain to many of you, I think, what those floppy disks that you had to install first meant uh, and the risk of losing all your work with one wrong click because we didn't have automatic backups. So that is just to say that there may be a, genera a generational gap when you look at the study of EU law which should not be a problem in itself. I think most professors today are very well acquainted also with the digital environment, but it may help to explain some of the tensions or the strain that we may have in quickly tackling the new tools available to us uh, digitally. So that is the first. Second major contextual change. So the first was that big digitalization uh, and the online uh, work setting for everyone. The second major change uh, was very recent, and I think all of us uh, will remember vividly the COVID situation, whereby we had a forced, quick digitalization of education, and I think of the working environment uh, as well. Uh, this is fairly recent, two, three years ago only, but then we saw really putting into place what was needed to pass to uh, using uh, at full capacity, the digital in educational and professional sphere. Suddenly, we had the creation of the infrastructure that was needed to do so, whereas before not all students had computers. We had old fashioned computer rooms in universities and also at the college. Today, we can assume that all students have a PC, have a laptop, uh, have all the digital equipment already from themselves or else it can be put at their disposal by the university. So we can assume that everyone has access to the digital infrastructure. Although also in terms of infrastructure, sometimes there are still problems such as plugs, sufficient plugs in classrooms to be able to charge your PC. So also there we still have a certain gap to reckon with. But on the whole, the infrastructure has been um, quickly updated in view of the COVID situation. The second major breakthrough was re with respect to the tools. At a time of COVID, we have seen the very quick putting into place of all kinds of platforms to allow for digital communication. Webex is one of them, we're using it now. You have MS Teams, you have all those digital platforms that suddenly were booming um, and that we are using very deftly also uh, now. The third major impact that COVID had on the education practice of the law and EU law in particular is also the sources that very quickly became digitalized uh, because there was the impossibility to move uh, in a physical way. We saw that many book publishers also uh, opened up their books and put them online, often for free or at very reduced cost for students and academia and sometimes also professionals. So the online libraries have quickly come to replace what remained of the more traditional uh, libraries. We can regret that. Personally, I like my books, as you can see uh, behind me, 
but I think it is a reality today that less and less you are required still to go to the library, but that publishers will also offer online all the sources that we need. We also see that, for instance, with the online Oxford Encyclopedia, which I think is a very good uh, uh, evolution. I remember being co-author of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Community Law, Volume 2. Uh, and just to say, we started uh, working on that in 1998, and the book was published. So the first time that the public could see what we were doing was in 2005. So that was quite static. It took a long time. But as, of course, now with the online sources, you can have a much quicker publicity given to the research that is being done. Um, and a much more easy and probably also much more um, affordable access to the sources of EU law. So we have online um, libraries, we have access to online sources. So we have infrastructures, tools and the sources, which have become very quickly digitalized because they had to be uh, in view of the COVID situation. Third, very important uh, contextual change that has influenced the study of EU law and the practice, I think, is the technological advances per se. So not necessarily linked specifically to COVID, but the new challenges, but also the new opportunities that they have created. And then I think, for instance, in terms of search um, functions, we think, of course, of the Google search function. I think all students and all practitioners use Google function at some point in their research and study, but also, for instance, the search form of the Court of Justice, which over time has become much more detailed and much more accessible. Now it's really a source of wealth for the study and practice of EU law. So the search forms and the search functions have much improved the way in which we can study and practice the law. Um, also, it is much more rapid now available with all the search functions. We have information just at the click of a hand or the click of a mouse, whereas before it was very time consuming. And as I said already, also to publish, uh, also the court reports, for instance, it took some time before the judgment was pronounced. And then by the time we had access to that judgment to be able to study and use it today, the law has become much more rapidly available to students and practitioners alike, which is, of course, a positive aspect, but it also, of course, causes some challenges in terms of keeping up with the rapidity of the change. Uh, other tools that we have available now that we didn't have before and which are a positive element, although all positive elements always also have a negative side that we have to reckon with, is the language checks that we have online and the possibility uh, for language support and even language translations being offered digitally, which is a good thing. It's important that we learn to work with it, all of us, but we also have to be aware uh, the attention was drawn to the importance of uh, translations and the different language versions of EU law, which have equal value. So it is also important to know the weaknesses uh, that may exist with those uh, digital tools in terms of correct language uh, translations, in particular of very specialized legal terms. Another technological advance, of course, is the artificial intelligence, very much a topic of debate today, but also social media where students uh, and also in, in practice, uh, definitely used to share information and to draw attention to certain uh, sources of the law, with then the risk, of course, attached to it also of distinguishing the real sources from the fake sources. Um, and think, for instance, of chat GPT, uh, which is now very much discussed in all university and postgraduate uh, institutions. What should we do with that? It is a very good development to have uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence being able to help the writing process, but of course uh, we should be aware also of the pitfalls of it and um, make sure that our students know how to distinguish what is good from what is fake in that sense. And then we have other issues that have emerged, but Paul is much more an expert on that, such as in terms of data protection. But it's not because you can use a lot of data and expose it very quickly that you're also entitled or should be entitled to do so. So we also have big questions there uh, in relation to uh, data protection rules. So we have a very 
uh, sort of rapid change in the digital context uh, against which we study and practice the law. Now, to come to the objectives, and that's my second big point of reflections, what is the impact on the objectives uh, when we talk about studying EU law? And I already mentioned studying EU law, in my view, should be in function of practicing EU law. Uh, these are not totally distinct matters. The study of EU law should help the practice of EU law later on, and the practice of EU law should influence and inspire the teaching of EU law. Um, however, that objective of why and how should we be studying EU law and law at all is not necessarily commonly shared among all the professors and within all the institutions. And today we see a very big tension in many university settings and postgraduate settings between two different objectives of studying the law. One being a static view, whereby students should be able to know what the state of the law is today and reproduce it and apply it. And then a second strand, which I believe in, which is much more dynamic, and to say, well, students should especially be able to understand the law, dispose of the necessary tools, know the structures and the basic principles, uh, should of course also be able to apply the law, but should also be able to anticipate the developments of the law. In other words, have a more dynamic and long context approach, which should then, in my view, also be more helpful for them in their future practice. Um, now, the old school, more static approach to the study of the law, although for me it is a non-option, transpires with uh, some of the colleagues and in some of the institutions, uh, whereby then there is a big uh, discussion also in, with respect to exams, should that be open book or closed book? Old school will go more for closed book exams. Um, some even still apply multiple choice, which of course uh, is uh, a method of exam if examination which does not at all take into account the dynamic aspects uh, of the law. Uh, and sometimes even refuse students access to paper version codexes and require students to learn things by heart. So that is still a strand that is living and that is being defended within educational institutions. And this is totally opposite to the dynamic uh, vision of the law and also the objectives of what the study of EU law should be about, which is of course all about being able to use all means at the disposal that you will have in legal practice, so all the digital means also, to understand the law, to anticipate the law, but also being aware of the pitfalls of the tools at hand and to have a critical analytical approach, not just to the subject matter of the law, but also to the methodology employed to study the law. So the dynamic uh, objective then of course goes more in the sense of having open book exams, um, of interacting, understanding the law in its context, anticipating the law, as I already said, uh, but also integrating uh, the correct information very rapidly. And very rapidly, as I already mentioned, is something which is enhanced by those uh, new developments uh, digitally. Um, and that rapidity in itself may be a problem and an issue because it also means that in our teaching we very rapidly have to adopt not just to the new methods but also to the new content. And then I come to the challenges um, and this will be my last points of reflection. The challenges that I see for studying EU law in particular because EU law I think is much more dynamic um, than probably most other strands of the law, think of national constitutional law, you will have some advances, but I don't think they're as, as rapid as EU law. Uh, Anthony Arnold just mentioned already also the big advance that uh, we have in terms of uh, um, topics addressed by EU law, and I think that's also the topic of the next uh, uh, communication here in the framework of this uh, online conference. So we have a lot of disciplines, uh, there is a lot of case law of the Court of Justice, there is a lot of legislation also every day we have new developments. So I think that EU law in particular is highly dynamic. 
So it is very challenging and very important that we find the right balance. The right balance whereby we combine, uh, I mean, the Court of Justice is always looking also for balancing uh, of different uh, um, objectives and concerns. I think that's also what we need to do when we study and practice EU law. We need to combine the best of both worlds, of the offline and the online world. Um, interactive teaching is, of course, the core of what our teaching should be, but you can do that both online and offline. And currently we do have uh, a tension between what students may want, especially since COVID, and what we as professionals of academic education may consider to be best suited. Um, at least in my perspective, but we can debate that, the best way to teach the law is an interactive manner in person, whereby you have a face-to-face -face, uh, interactive class with the students. Um, but of course, now that COVID has, how should I say, it made some students aware of the possibilities of just taking classes, sitting at home, um, we see that some students are less inclined to go back to that in-person teaching for a variety of reasons. It can be comfort of sitting at home, but it can also be the possibility of hiding um, behind a screen and this escaping more interactive methods of teaching. So, in my view, we should go back to in-person teaching as much as possible, but in an interactive manner and integrating online elements where possible and where we feel it is indicated. Uh, why do we go to that in-person teaching? Well, we just heard it also. You also cannot just go back to purely applying digital means to discuss issues such as the rule of law or to decide outcomes by the court. So the humane aspect, the human factor, in studying and analyzing the law is, and I also believe remains, very important for the future. So we need to have that interactive, in-person approach between the professors and the students. But that doesn't mean that we should not integrate the digital in our teachings. And we can do that in three manners. The first one is also when you teach in person, you can integrate online tools. I think most of us teaching the law, studying the law, know that today students come to the classrooms and quite rightly so, I would think, with their laptops with them, with their mobile phones with them. And then, of course, the challenge is to make sure that they do not use the those digital tools to be surfing on other platforms, but that they use it in order to um, interact on an issue of EU law, that they go searching on their digital tools in order to stimulate the interaction in the classroom so that we integrate the use of those digital tools in our in-person teaching sessions. Not easy to do, but I think it is important that we are open to that and that we try to do that as much as possible. The second is digital written work is, of course, very important. It's important that the youngsters also continue to use that that they make class presentations in the forms of PowerPoints, that they do write papers digitally, and that they do write their thesis, of course, digitally. However, we already talked about chat, chat GTP, uh, and the problem that may arise, of course, is that we are no longer able to assess whether the students have performed the work themselves or not. Although I think if we do start with that in-person um, sort of interaction with the professor and the student, we can quite easily overcome that if all the written work is to be defended in person and orally by the student. PowerPoint presentations have to be orally presented, so you can easily check whether the students have made a good use of the dig digital tools available or whether they have misunderstood the use of those tools. Similarly, with written papers and theses, uh, it becomes even more crucial than before to have that oral defense Whereas before this was good for the language skills and oral uh, skills of the students, today it's also increasingly important to make sure that students have learned to use the correct sources and distinguish the fake from the good sources of EU law. And then also in terms of exams, 
there we can embrace fully the digital. All those a lot of colleagues still want to go in the direction of having handwritten exams, closed book exams, and then the discussion is about whether or not students can use codexes and annotate. But I think this is totally outdated, that approach that we should squarely opt for the digital exams, digital open book exams. I mean, I think it's illusory to think that we can block access to all kinds of platforms that students could use to try and influence their work. Instead, we should embrace that and tell them, yes, in your professional life, in your practice of EU law, you will be able to use all those sources. So it is important that you know how to use them correctly. And that also our exam systems are conceived in such a manner that the students will not be able to simply search on Google or use chat, uh, chat G, uh, GPT in order to get a correct answer. Now, this, of course, means that we have to rethink also our evaluation systems, our exam systems. But I think it is the only possibility if we want to educate the students in a way that will be useful for their legal practice later on. So this requires a constant adaptation also on behalf of the teachers and the educational systems. But as long as we are open minded and critical and analytical to see what the developments are, I'm sure that we can use the digital to its uh, advantage and not be afraid of it for the future. And I'll stop here because Paul will now talk, I think, more about the practice. Thank you very much, Inga. Uh, Paul, perhaps you'd like to pick up the baton um, and, and take us further. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, and uh, thank you uh, to all who have made uh, the uh, new encyclopedia possible. I think it's uh, uh, important that in this world of uh, technology and increasing complexity, both of technology and the related law, we strive over and over again to maintain the overall coherence of the legal system. And also we strive uh, to maintain the autonomy of the legal system and its underlying tools, uh, namely the tools of democracy and language uh, in front of what I would call a straightforward uh, an attack of technology and the code. So let me set out a few uh, uh, theses on uh, our theme um, of today. And the first would be that the increasingly global structures and technologies of digitalization have a unifying trend across the world in terms of communication patterns, business and science, political campaigning and research. They make all member states of the EU certainly increasingly a community of risks and opportunities, which can only be managed together due to reasons of leverage. Let's not forget the power of big tech and reasons of spillover effects in the common market, but also in our common area of liberty, democracy and fundamental rights governed by the rule of law. Example, if GDPR is not properly enforced, for example, by the Irish authority towards the big tech companies, which have their European seats in Ireland, citizens in all member states suffer a lack of protection of rights. And so um, this is what I would call uh, the community of risks. Our national authorities and national courts become agents for the protection of people all over Europe. And the concept of the national authority and the national court in such context is increasingly outdated. In view of these global structures and technologies, it is increasingly anachronistic to insist in the legal discourse on the specificity of member states. The normative power of the factual of digitalization decreases differences and thus makes common responses vital because the power of the normative of the factual cannot be opposed or even framed by the member states alone. They lack the necessary leverage and because divergent ways of individual member states have negative spillover effects on other member states, I just mentioned 
the example uh, of Ireland, both regards the internal market and the protection of fundamental rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Law making becomes a key necessity in the digital age in order to maintain the primacy of democracy over technology. The techno-solutionist discourse increasingly undermines democracy and the most noble act of democracy through which it expresses itself, namely the making of law. The claim that law, whether domestic or international, is not necessary and only technology can solve the problems of this world Remember Trump's arguments to leave the Paris Climate Accords, where he said American technology would solve the climate problem. We don't need this international agreement. The claim that law is an obstacle to innovation and should only be put in place to avoid material harm and be risk-based only deprives democracy of the power to shape society positively and reduces it to a repair mechanism for the harm created by business models and new technology, rather than allowing democracy to guide technology development and business models through law towards the common good. In a world of ever fasting move, fast moving innovation of business models and technology, this strategy is increasingly dangerous, both because the distance because the, between the new risk and then being addressed through law will increase in this approach. And second, because democracy is reduced to a purely reactive force rather than the core of self-determination of people and then being able to shape their lives positively and thus making it worse and providing motivation to engage in democracy for the purpose of self-determination. Let me be very clear. I see a mutual reinforcement of the techno-solutionist discourse and the down-talking of democracy by autocrats and um, right-wing populists. The vice president of Microsoft, Brad Smith, argues that only courts will be able in the future to carry out the difficult balance of the different interests and rights involved in regulating the digital sphere. He claims that legislators are not any more able to get the balance right, um, um, uh, which is so complex. And we have heard a little bit about the complexity uh, of this balance and uh, um, uh, the need to ever search it again uh, in the initial presentation of uh, Judge Sapia. This analysis of Brad Smith is certainly true for the present state of the US Congress, which is not any more able to produce any laws necessary to frame the new business models and technologies of the digital economy. In contrast, in Europe, there is no failure, such failure of democracy yet, and we should not allow it to happen. The essential matters of society must be dealt with in democratic process, and I liked the emphasis of Paul Newell there at the beginning in his graphics. Process is a key um, element of the rule of law, but the democratic process is, of course, at the core of a democracy, and it must still be the choice for regulating how we live, thus through law, even if the corporate world may prefer an only judged ruled world as they command resources to capture the best advocates, thus making their ability to use legal procedures always, of course, to the last instance, that's a pattern of the digital, uh, digital companies on any decision which they don't like, they go to the last instance, whether in competition law, uh, privacy protection, consumer protection, always last instance, the signal to the regulator is quite clear. If you fuss with us, we will bog you down for years. And their power before courts is even more disproportional in terms of their ability to input into the legal process as it is already at the level of lawmaking. To take Paul Nierhul's initial graphic, if we would in parallel to this graphic, put the pressure and economic resources of corporates, which they put into play on each element and stage of the, both of the graphics, we would find that 
the hearing, the voice being heard of normal people declines the higher we go in the graphic, while the accumulated amounts of corporate money which flow into either litigation or uh, legislative lobbying increases. And my bet is that we would, if you accumulate the money which flows into um, um, briefs and lawyers for highest instances and compare it to the money which is put into legislative lobbying, uh, if we take um, a look at uh, uh, the companies, the money which flows um, into work on the judiciary is actually much more than flows into the legislative lobbying. It is all the more so important that judges are made conscious of this power relation and are having the courage to withstand the resulting pressure. I think the Court of Justice is quite good at that in contrast to the US Supreme Court. It is probably fair to say that the EU Court of Justice today is the court which in a global scale shapes most and most coherently the digital environment. So let me be very clear, I absolutely don't share, uh, you know, what we hear from uh, some American authors uh, most prominent during the negotiations of Privacy Shield, Bob Litt at the time, the general counsel of uh, the director of national intelligence uh, in the White House who wrote in the Financial Times, the European Court of Justice doesn't know what it's talking about. My comment to him at the time was, if he would or someone would comment like that on the US Supreme Court, that would be contempt of court. The legacy of the Court of Justice, together with the high intensity of this legacy of already having shaped the digital environment, together with the high intensity of democratic lawmaking on the digital in the EU, EU put a very high responsibility on the Court of Justice. It has a duty to maintain the coherence of the legal system overall and to give interpretations to the law with art, which are in line with the state of art of technology and business models at the time of judgment, as well as the potential opportunities and risks of the technology and business models in question before the court. For the good functioning of democracy, the effective delivery and, protect, and protection of fundamental rights and the system of the rule of law, which requires laws to be able to be effectively enforced, including against global players of the digital economy. On the other hand, let's also be honest, let's put not the bar too high. There is no law which is perfectly in the, enforced in this world and requiring that on the digital economy only perfect laws can be made, um, which uh, can be perfectly enforced, uh, obviously means that we will never and ever have any new law in the digital sphere because no law in this world, as any lawyer knows, uh, can be enforced perfectly, not in taxation, and not even the criminal law provision on, you know, please no murder, uh, even uh, this principle already from the Bible, um, you know, is, is ignored uh, every day. So equipping future generations of lawyers requires at the same time, a rehabilitation of the power of language as our tool of choice of democracy, deliberation and the law before the court and automation, such as chat GPT on the one hand, but at the same time, a better understanding of these technologies and business models. Sentences like, the law must evolve as fast as the code, or we would rather have no law than a bad law, try to impress the functioning rules of code on the world of the law. But let us not forget, the code is written for stupids. Who are the stupids? It's the computers. They cannot think by themselves. That is why if computers don't function well, the code needs to be updated. And in case of the mobile phone, we know it's happening every few weeks. In contrast, human language is written for humans who can think themselves. They can reinterpret the law in line of technological and social development and also business models, if the law is written in a sufficiently technology neutral way and open to future development. We must resist 
the pressure by the world of business and engineering to write laws like engineering handbooks fit perfectly to the business model of today and using the technological buzzwords of the day, which in this fast moving world change by the hour. And we must keep the law technologically neutral in order to maintain its relevance for a long time into the future. So that even if technology and business models move fast forward, the law remains relevant. Democracy cannot and should not constantly write new laws, but rather write laws in such a way that they maintain relevance for a long time, even if technology evolves. And I think GDPR is a good example for this. And this need to learn about the relevance, the new relevance of language in a fast moving technological world and this new way of making uh, legislation, or let's say this old way of make, making legislation, because of course we know that the constitutions being the most open to the future are the best laws, they stay in place for longest time and keep relevance. And um, I think it is important that we decline uh, this knowledge of uh, traditional law and lawyers into the future and into the digital world and that that becomes uh, also the core of our teaching of the future of the relevance of law of the future of the importance of engaging in democracy uh, for the students at the college and other law schools in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Paul. And thank you very much indeed. Um, let's now move on because we are conscious of time <clears throat> and we have our next two speakers, um, an academic duo who, uh, of course, uh, uh, likewise need hardly an introduction, Paul Craig and uh, Granit de Berke. Paul is um, Professor of English Law and Fellow of St. John's College in Oxford, and he specialises in constitutional and administrative law, comparative public law, and of course, EU law, as we all know uh, so well. He's published extensively in all these areas and among students of EU law of course will be most famous for the tentpole book the absolute uh, pillar uh, Craig and de Berke and also the evolution of law which has gone into also like um, the textbook has gone into various editions also with Grania. Uh, Grania is professor of law and faculty director at NYU Law School before that she held uh, tenure positions at Harvard at Fordham and at the European University Institute in Fiesole, and was a at the beginning of her career a Somerville uh, uh, College Fellow and a lecturer in law at Oxford University. Uh, she has, of course, as uh, uh, just suggested, co-authored uh, and co-edited many things with um, Paul Craig, and uh, of course they're both um, editors of the Oxford uh, series, the Oxford Studies in European Law, uh, which is extremely well-known um, series of uh, dissertations and other monographs, and also the, involved in the she's involved in the International Journal of Constitutional Law and the American Journal of International Law, the grand old um, uh, uh, journal uh, which is uh, plays such an important role in uh, international law. Paul, you're um, you're with us uh, uh, literally. So I think you, you and um, Grania have, have recorded uh, speeches. Sasha, shall I let you manage that? Hello, Paul. Maybe, hello. Maybe Paul would like to say just a few words and then our ICT. No, no. Okay, so our ICT. No, no, of course. No, 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 no. That was a nod. That was, <laughs> it was a yes rather than a no. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for having us as part of this panel. Many congratulations on the EU Encyclopedia. It's a terrific achievement. And um, we are delighted, Gronio and I are delighted to have taken part in this. And um, as you said, partly because of time issues, we pre recorded a dialogue between us. And I think Sasha is going to play it to you. And then we're very happy at any stage 
during the panel discussion thereafter to take any questions about it. Um, so, Sasha, over to you. All right. It will be launched as of magic by our ICT service right now. Hello, Paul. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to you online today and to be um, preparing this conversation for the launch of the OUP Oxford Encyclopedia of EU Law. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, I look or or even online live. But uh, I hope this uh, conversation um, will be an interesting part of the program. So, Paul, I'm going to start uh, with a first question about um, the spread and growth and fragmentation of EU law, um, and ask it to you from the teaching perspective. Um, do you think it makes sense anymore to think of a core EU law course? Is there such a thing as the basic core EU law course that might be taught? Thank you, Gronia. Um, great to be on the call with you and taking part in this joint discourse uh, for the launch of the new encyclopedia. So uh, I don't know if I'm in the minority or not, I mean, I really genuinely don't know, but my view is that there is still a core EU law course in the following sense. There are certain topics which you need to have understood and studied before you can go on and do anything else. Now, you can debate about precisely what those topics are, but in my view, and I don't regard this as particularly complex or controversial, but I may be wrong, but some idea of the basic, my sense of what that core is before you can do anything else, before you can you've got to run, you know, walk before you can run, is you've got to know something about the history and background, you've not got to know something about the institutions, who they are, what the commission is, what the council is, what the parliament is, you've got to know something about lawmaking, you've got to know something about competencies, um, that kind of thing, and some of the core central uh, concepts developed principally by the Court of Justice, whether that's direct effect, whether it's general principles of law, whether it's supremacy. It does seem to me that unless you have that background, you can't really do anything else because anything else you do without doing that background involves that background. And in a sense, you'd just be playing catch up the whole time in trying to do a more specific subject or more specific part of EU law if you didn't have those foundations. So I'd just be interested in your view about whether I'm out on a limb in that respect or not. No, I think I agree with you about that. And I would even say, I think maybe the trickier part comes to when you say what areas of substantive law, because yeah. um, obviously what is the EU, what are its powers, its structure, the core key doctrines that affect every area of the law, that seems self-evident, but then when it comes to, well, internal market, how much, and, you know, other kinds of, you know, external relations and so on, these, you know, you might think, but those are important, and yet are they essential, you know, so there are questions that are maybe more difficult, but I guess that I asked the question partly because when I was thinking about, you know, EU law as a coherent subject, because I teach here in the US, I was thinking no US law student has a class called American law or introduction to American law. No. You know, they have True. constitutional law, criminal law, tort law, and so on as they work through their law uh, studies. However, the international students who come do get a class called introduction to American law. So I was thinking yeah. about it along those lines. But that, that would mean, interestingly, that EU law is still somehow not necessarily foreign law for the students, but it's a it's an additional subject. You know, it, it it's sort of um, additional to national law, and therefore and builds in some way on it. And you can't learn EU law in a non-relational way. You know, in relation to to national law. I certainly but, agree. I, I certainly agree that um, in addition to the topics I put on the table, I agree that there's got to be some substantive law in that initial core course, because I think that you really can't get an understanding. It's not just 
understanding the topic in itself, but I really think you can't get an understanding of what EU law is without not in uh, without having some substantive component choose whatever bit of the internal market you want and it depends how long your course is and how much time you've got but you've got to have something on goods or people or establishment um, in order to get them to understand the way in which these concepts such as direct effect and supremacy operate in action in reality and also to understand some of the core values which the EU is actually espousing. Yeah, and I think that last point is important because, you know, when you first answered the question or you're, you suggested, well, you know, we need a case study, for example, of how these principles work in practice. We need a substantive area to see how it all works. But I think with the internal market, it's a bit more than that, that it is, for better or for worse, more than just a policy area, it's a, it's a value. You know, the EU still has this very dense core of economic liberalization and market making, and, and that is, in a sense, transversal, and, and uh, it would be difficult to understand the EU and EU law if you just did a, an institutional law course followed by maybe some specialized justice and home affairs or environmental law or um, foreign and security policy or something else you know, without really understanding uh, the internal market, I think. But let me I ask agree. you a related question, maybe, um, to, to this, which is that quite apart from what should go in a core course, um, and, and as you said, you know, what would be in an introductory foundational course, is there a sense in which you think EU law has become so complex not just fragmented or multiplying in the number of substantive fields of, of EU law, but actually very complex in its doctrines, even the core doctrines, even direct and indirect effect or um, or some of these, that, that makes it particularly challenging to teach as a core subject. I think it is. Um, I mean, I'm teaching, as you know, I'm teaching at the moment for a semester at NYU Abu Dhabi, and I have a diverse and cosmopolitan group of students. Pretty much about 90% of them are not from the EU. So what that means is that um, they have less background understanding at the beginning about what the, uh, an institution like the EU is. But also what it means is that focusing directly on the question that you asked, I think there's, there is a dilemma. There's a dilemma certainly in teaching and in writing. There's a dilemma in teaching and writing, which is that people always want the best of two worlds when the two worlds are pulling in opposite direction. I mean, on the one hand, people want, you know, give us every latest case, give us all the detail, give us, you know, the um, fourth dimension or nuance on indirect effect or, you know, tweak it in this way, tweak it in that way. So they want that, they want a book to contain that. And at the same time, they want the book to be easy to read and clear and relatively brief. And the trouble is that those impulses pull in opposite directions, which is why certainly when both writing Craig and the Burke or teaching the subject, I make decisions the whole time based partly on, particularly if I'm, the teaching and the writing are different, but certainly if I'm, when I'm teaching, I make decisions the whole time, sometimes live decisions when I'm actually teaching about what level of detail is this group really, what level of detail do they need to know, what level of detail are they capable of knowing, uh, of understanding. Because sometimes less is more. I mean, when you we all know that when you're teaching, sometimes if you go to a further level of detail, you're just going to lose people in their analysis you know, when you undertake that level of analysis. Um, what do you think? I'm thinking as you're speaking that I'm really looking forward to seeing this Oxford Encyclopedia online <laughs> and, and to trying out different uh, subtopics because I, I imagine the authors of those entries uh, you encountered exactly this dilemma which is an encyclopedia by definition aims to be rather comprehensive and yet if it reaches that degree of complexity and difficulty it's not going to be 
uh, very useful for those who are being introduced to the subject. And it's often those being introduced to the subject who consult an encyclopedia. Um, you know, I, I mm. guess I, I often find, uh, interestingly, and this is looking at the teaching side of it rather than the writing side, that the classes I teach here in the US contain both audiences, which is really tricky. So yeah. I have the sophisticated, intelligent uh, JD, often American, but you know, yeah. studying in, in the US students on the one hand who know nothing about the EU and its background or its institutions or anything. And then I have highly sophisticated students coming sometimes from the EU who've taken multiple courses, but just want to see how it's taught from a US perspective or you know, something else and to cater to both of those audiences simultaneously is difficult <laughs> and it really reflects uh, totally. those, those two impulses that you describe the idea of a, you know, simpler introductory clear but uh, getting to the heart of it. And then, on the other hand, the updating the nuance, the complexity, the debates, the um, and it's not easy. I mean, I, I have tried. <laughs> I don't know whether successfully or not, but I, I think it's a challenge um, for sure for EU law. So that does um, lead on to a further question, I think, which flows from what we've just been talking about, which is, should EU books reflect the important new topics? I mean, we're all aware that there are, that we write books and that when we write books, definitionally, when we write books, we're writing books on certain assumptions about what are the key parts or key topics to be covered. But of course, things change over time, things move over time. Um, and we, it's partly, there are simply new topics because of new ranges of competence which the EU has acquired. It may be that there are new topics because of exogenous reasons. There'll be a health crisis and the health crisis generates a new topic or gives a whole dimension to a topic about EU health competence, which it didn't have before. So there's really a, a, an interesting question about both about teaching and about writing books about the extent to which one should attempt, if at all, to bring in new topics into the book when writing it or updating it, and or the extent to which one brings in the new topics when teaching. Yeah. What do you think? You know, it's, as you know, it's a, it's a question we've often asked ourselves and um, when when preparing an edition of the textbook and in a way I guess the um, we've had a fortunate no, I won't call it a safety valve but alternative which is that rather than constantly growing the textbook which students already complain to the extent that they use the physical book rather than online how heavy it is maybe yes. the, the online era makes that less of a problem but it's certainly a very uh, big and rather daunting book so Obviously, what you and I have done is, is we have this parallel book um, on the evolution of EU law, which has given us the leeway to address those newer topics, for mm -hmm. example, you know, digitalization or health or climate, um, which are crucial uh, areas of what the EU does and, and you know, we mm -hmm. can make that available for those who are interested in the EU, but which would swell the textbook in ways that would become unmanageable, we feel, even even though we have actually added some new uh, new areas. But I do feel there are some topics which grow, and, and we've talked about this recently, and maybe um, the, the last edition already reflected this. For example, the rule of law, um, which begins to become so central in a sort of a, an elemental way that it runs through other things or it's foundational, that it doesn't, it's not enough to have it in the companion evolution book, but that where we can yeah part of the core subject and uh, yeah. you know, as we've discussed we've done this by <clears throat> thinking about the rule of law as an aspect of membership condition exit entry and membership as these dimensions of the contract states make with the EU and they join um, and that that's more foundational and I suspect that might happen with other areas that, that become actually quite central 
uh, in a way to the core um, and, and it might need to be in a, a textbook or a basic course and not just a companion volume that contains these other more specialized or newer policy fields. I think that the example about, I mean, I, I agree with you entirely in that, and I think that the example about the chapter that we put in in the last edition about membership, which we're going to tweak again, um, at the moment it's just called membership, but deals with basically at the moment two topics, which are exit, um, I Brexit, and membership obligations while you are a member, hence the rule of law. But we're going to tweak that a bit further and actually make it uh, is entirely as you suggested, a chapter about entry membership and exit, because those really are all different dimensions of membership. And I think that is a coherent and important topic in itself. And it brings together Copenhagen criteria on the one hand, how do you get in? Article 50 and Brexit, how do you get out? And then the obligations you have, which are extant while you're in the EU, the rule and the important rule of law things. And I think that's coherent. And I think that is one of the challenges. One of the challenges uh, when dealing with this material is not only the challenge of its space, and that's a huge challenge, the books can't get bigger, but also a challenge in terms of coherence. You want, you don't want just bitty things all over the place. It's actually a, a challenge of including things in a coherent way, a coherent way in and of themselves and a coherent way within the broader confines of the book. And um, that, is, that is a challenge. Uh, but I mean, at the same time, it makes it all rather exciting. I mean, it would be a bit boring if, yeah. if we were just, if we we were were just in the... Same. The steady state the whole time. Yeah. It would be a bit boring, I think. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I do remember when we, you know, when we created a, a chapter on anti discrimination law, it had evolved originally as sex equality, and now it's a more mm. transversal one. I was thinking recently whether that might happen eventually with something like mutual trust, you know, which for now was just sort of a bit of party, the internal market, party, the area of freedom, security and justice, um, you know, maybe private internet or not private international law, but um, civil cooperation and so on. But I can imagine that also given the tensions with the rule of law and the changing fragmented nature of the EU, we might eventually have a more foundational transversal chapter on, um, yeah. on mutual trust. Um, but these yeah. are the kinds of things we have to keep an eye on, uh, I guess. To, to manage, as you say, the tension between keeping the book stable and manageable and, uh, you know, focused on the core and at the same time being sensitive to changes that are sufficiently important that they reshape that core. I agree. I agree. Um, so, um, uh, uh, perhaps as a final uh, question for discussion, there is the diversity of EU law also could manifest itself in a different way, which is a diversity in terms of application, such that one might think of having almost comparative EU law books where you might think of, you know, a Dutch, you know, a, a, a uh, version of EU law from a Dutch perspective or Italian perspective or German perspective. Um, and in some ways, one's kind of reminded of that or thinking about that is precipitated by the British experience, the UK experience, because one of the things we decided to do when we, when the UK left is to run two versions of the book. So we had this, the straight EU law book for non-UK people, but because of Brexit and because the position of EU law in relation to the UK obviously definitionally changed, um, uh, there were issues in relation which we dealt with in relation to the UK version, which were left out of um, other version uh, of the non-UK version, and it would just be interesting to reflect more generally about whether there's space, whether there'll be interest in 
mm. even for countries which are still within the EU, um, for those 27 countries, more nationally focused EU law books. Uh, I don't know, what do you think? Yes, I think it's a very interesting question, um, this idea of is, is there a comparative EU law? Um, I know that question was addressed in a book about international law some years ago by Anthea Roberts, where she suggested that there isn't a universal uh, single body of, of international law. It, there's a comparative international law that's you know, quite different in different regions and different within different states. Even the core doctrines of international law look a bit different when refracted through the lens of national law. And, and she didn't mean foreign relations law, but just simply international law as it's understood. And that got me thinking about the EU. And we had a conversation with some of our postdoctoral students here recently about whether a project of that kind would be uh, an interesting one. Um, I mean, there are already, of course, books on EU law in the Netherlands, in Germany, and so on, uh, in Spain and Italy that look at uh, EU law in, in the context of that jurisdiction or state. But it would be interesting to think about First, a coordinated project of that kind, and secondly, a, a kind of comprehensive one where every state, uh, you know, a, a, maybe a, an academic from each state would reflect on whether there is a distinctive uh, understanding of EU law, not just how does that constitution deal with EU law, but how are the doctrines of EU law understood within that member state and are they different, are they distinctive? So it's a big project, but I, I could certainly see that being a very interesting one. I think so too. Um, uh, I think so too. And given, I mean, just as a, I think as a finishing note, I mean, one of the things which we've been blessed with in EU law is that there's just been a very rich academic tradition with a lot of good young people getting interested in the subject from all over the EU. So there's lots of young, vibrant scholars out there. So we have people who could write books of this nature. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing, just to, to finish up, as we're running out of time, but to say is that yeah. we haven't really talked about as well is the critical turn in EU law. Um, the turn, you know, it's it's changed a lot. I think over the last decade, you know, there used to be a sense that EU law was written by supporters of the subject, and that it was, you know, expected that writing about EU law meant you broadly supported the process of integration, and that's mm. really been unsettled in recent years where there's a much more, you know, partly since the Euro crisis, but also more generally with the turn to colonial um, readings of the EU and so on, that there's a really interesting body of, uh, of literature coming out from the, um, the, the next generation of EU law scholars. So watch this space. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. I mean, in certainly, Certainly, in in kind of my lifetime as an academic, there's been almost kind of three periods. I mean, um, at, at the beginning when I first started studying EU law and then began to write on it, it was really mainly colonised by international lawyers, and there was a rather rose-tinted view about the whole subject, um, and rather uncritical. And then, for I guess the bulk of uh, my time as an academic, um, there were more specialist EU scholars in their own right who inhabited the terrain and um, wrote analytically and critically about EU doctrine. Um, they weren't at all afraid to criticize the court or the, or the institutions or whatever. But I think you're absolutely right. I think we have seen a third generation now coming along, which is critical in a rather different way. Um, more critical, in, if, if I can put it, but also critical from a, in, a, in, in a different way, whether it's from a critical legal studies perspective or colonial law perspective, whatever. Um, and I think, look, you know, plurality of views is, is healthy. Um, it doesn't mean I agree with all those critiques, far from it, but I just think that many views of the cathedral is a rather positive thing. I agree, and maybe that's mm -hmm. a good note on which to end mm -hmm. the plurality and pluralism. Of <laughs> but thanks for the conversation, Paul, um, and we will be uh, 
speaking about these topics uh, many times in the next uh, over the next year as we prepare our next edition indeed and i will give you feedback i will uh, be online at the conference at sasha and lawrence's conference i'll give you feedback about how it all plays out great thank you yeah well, thank you thank you very much indeed paul and uh, agrania excellent Thank you very much. Um, Sasha, just looking at you, we're now planning to go to the um, to the panel discussion. Right, We've got uh, um, four panelists, minutes. and I can I, I can introduce very briefly. Yeah. Um, looking at the time, um, how do you want to to play I this thought, further? I thought after you've introduced uh, the panelists, they can maybe uh, each for three minutes or so re reply, share their thoughts, ask questions to the speakers, whatever they like. We then see if maybe the speakers want to uh, react to that. And then we conclude with another round of brief comments, final remarks by the panel members again. Okay, lovely. Well, let me just uh, do the first uh, task. Um, uh, our panelists are also very famous and celebrated um, uh, scholars. Uh, Monica Klaus has, is the Professor of European and Comparative Constitutional Law at Maastricht University and is leading scholar on the relation between European and national constitutional law, the development of European constitutional space, common constitutional principles and the concept of national constitutional identity. She's also on the editorial board of the European Constitutional Law Review, EU Const, and of the Tijdschrift for Constitutionel Recht, um, the well-known Dutch periodical. Um, Catherine Jackson, our second panelist, is professor in EU law at the University of Copenhagen um, and is a leading scholar on the free movement of persons within and to the EU and on the social aspects of the EU. She's the co-general editor of the European Journal of Social Security. And between her doctorate in Copenhagen and her professorship there, she was also at St. John's College, Oxford, um, as a postdoctoral research fellow in European and comparative law, um, you know, being, being an MA of, of Oxford University is, of course, not a requirement for uh, being a, on a member of the advisory board, but there seem to be quite a few of them. Um, Joanna Mendes, uh, third panelist, is Professor of Comparative and Administrative Law at the University of Luxembourg since 2016. Before that, she was at the University of Amsterdam as Associate Professor in the Department of International EU Law, and she was also in charge of uh, doctoral candidates uh, in, in the faculty. She was awarded a Veni grant by the Dutch Research Council, the NVO, for her project on EU administrative discretion, and has published widely on a whole range of EU law issues, particular expertise on administrative law. She is a member of the editorial board of the German Law Journal, and was co-editor-in-chief of the European Law Journal between 2018 and 2020 with Harm Schreppel. And finally, Professor Daniel Samiento um, is Professor of Administrative and Uni European Union Law at Complutense University in Madrid. He's written extensively on the Union's judiciary, its sources of law, uh, institutional law and fundamental rights, and is currently the editor-in-chief of the highly influential um, a, a website, EU Law Live, uh, a quality online resource on everything which is related to EU law. And we're also very grateful to uh, Daniel for um, being willing to ensure the sustainability of this uh, webinar, web, webinar via uh, EU Law Live. So without more ado, I suggest we ask our panellists, perhaps in the uh, in the order I introduce them, Monica, Catherine, uh, Joanna, and, uh, and Daniel, um, to take the floor and um, to uh, proceed as Sasha suggested. So perhaps Monica. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and first of all, congratulations on, on this wonderful uh, initiative on, on the encyclopedia and on today's uh, event. Um, and my first comment would be, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. It was a very rich, very rich, um, 
uh, event with with many ideas and we were asked to reflect i think originally on the program there was almost an hour there would be discussion etc um, but in light of the time i will um, reduce my comments to only um, three short ideas maybe there is time for discussion maybe not a, there could be takeaways to think about later on so i was going to start with a praise of our field um, uh, EU law as, as a field of scholarship, which I'm going to delete because I think that we all um, know about that, uh, the dynamics of the, but, but that, that field of, of EU law and EU law scholarship also comes with a number of challenges. And I would like to mention, I've reduced it to, to two challenges and one threat. One challenge is one that maybe we can solve. Um, and since um, either OUP is here or you are closely uh, connected to it, um, and it was mentioned several times today, so that one of the challenges of EU law is, is the, in the nature of the field that we are studying, right, with the diversity of um, legal backgrounds, of languages, of versions, etc., and um, and the richness of that, right? So the plurality of views, etc., um, on that. And here it's very changed, uh, strange that with all the new technologies, it's so difficult still to access uh, scholarship in different languages, which is which is impoverishes the debate, right? Because each of these national backgrounds enrich EU law, right? So so. Here, this is a call for, to to publishers um, and those who know to fun, to to operate techno new technologies. There should be ways technologically to open up um, scholarship in one language to readership in other languages. That would be such an enrichment to the field of EU law. That was challenge one, which I think can be solved. Challenge two is, I think, is impossible to solve, or at least I have not yet found the way. That's the sheer volume of excellent scholarship um, and the lack of time for all of us to read it. So how do we sift through the information that we get and to find what the excellent scholarship is. And here I find that we still use the old fashioned ways, right? So we have peer review, we have um, reputation of journals, of publishers, of individual scholars, of institutions, um, but we have to do that in a new context of blogs, of uh, et cetera, and then um, finding our way through that and then accidentally finding the, the good stuff to be read there, I do not see a solution yet, but I would like to mention very briefly a threat, the threat that I see, and that is the question of how do we retain our legitimacy, the legitimacy of EU law scholarship as a field, and we are part of universities, of um, the elite, um, and um, we are challenged as such, right? Generally, in more corner, um, more part, uh, some parts of Europe more than in other parts, academic freedom is challenged, but also more broadly, our authority is no longer so self-evident. And here, I'm not saying that our authority should be self-evident, but still, the um, the um, ex our expertise that is asked uh, very often is also challenged. Um, and legal scholarship is more challenged, perhaps, than, than other types of scholarship because of the, the indeterminacy of the law. Moreover, the closeness of um, some of us to um, institutions and which questions our uh, neutrality. This has been raised in various pieces that have pu been published over the past years. But what I would like to put on the table is this, uh, this new development, I think, of... Um, um, what is sometimes referred to as fake research, so of universities and research institutions that have been established more fairly recently to um, develop uh, scholarship that does not comply with the traditional standards of neutrality and objectivity, um, even new journals that have been established in order to support the views of um, some who are not um, friends of the principles of liberal democracy. How do we deal with that and how should we approach these types of evolutions as academics? And I, in light of time, I will keep it to this. Yeah, 
I think I will take over it. Do you hear me? Yeah, thank you very much for yes. uh, for, invi for inviting me to this uh, inspiring and stimulating seminar. And I'm really happy to be with you all uh, from Copenhagen and to celebrate the launch of the EU online uh, encyclopedia. I think it's a brilliant initiative. And um, I, I really liked the fact that it's a living instrument, that there are articles popping up all the time. And also, I liked the, the, the ambition that it should, as Paul and Grain were saying, that it should be written in a plain and very easy accessible uh, language and at the same time builds on uh, on very um, on deep research. So th this is really, I think, a difficult task and it's a challenge talking about challenges, but one which has been uh, really successfully addressed, I think, by the authors. So really big, uh, huge congratulations from here. Um, Time is running. I, I was a little bit like also Monica preparing a more um, detailed presentation of, um, of the topic of union citizenship, the topic I know a lot about. But I will maybe also just um, kick very quick uh, short on uh, two themes, three themes that were um, oh, two, two themes which were raised today about the teaching and the importance that there is some EU law course. I really as a coordinator of the EU law course in English in, uh, in Copenhagen, I really think that this is still be very important to have kind of EU law course, even though we are very much focused on only the internal market and union citizenship, as all the principle and the institution are in the Danish constitutional course. Already we have this division and, and looking only at the, the very core and basic of uh, of the EU being still the internal market, but the internal market has a revival. And as Paul Nemis was saying, it, there's a huge euphoria also in uh, in uh, legislation at EU level, tackling the digitalization uh, uh, challenges and also putting uh, the EU on, um, on a global scene and in trying to be a trendsetter in, uh, in this respect, whereas maybe the US has US Congress has maybe left, uh, has given up on that. The EU is still trying to do something. And uh, and I think that is that is something which should should also be integrated in the in the way that we in, in the, the substantive law that we are teaching our EU uh, EU law students. So in this respect, um I think that's still a place for, for textbooks and for the internal uh, market and also in the light of the challenges that we are facing, digitalization, but not only, also climate change where the EU is also quite active. So in this sense, we can really stimulate uh, an um, interest of, of students. And the last thing maybe was my initial remark on the more substantive law, as uh, Paul was referring to. And here I'm, I'm thinking about union citizenship and the the the, the, the first uh, the, the, one of the first discussions um, by uh, Verica and Tony on uh, the unity in the case law and the new trends in the European Court of Justice case law where we can see that from the, that that the, 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 the European Court of Justice is pulling the break in um, in equal treatment of non-economically active union citizens and maybe trying to set a common standard which is um, which is that when it's an area is regulated by secondary law here the citizenship provision we should focus and only solve the the problems regarding to that is there right a residence or is there not and in this sense it can be said that it, that there is maybe a more common approach uh, towards um, the union it, by the european court towards all areas of eu law but at the same time it raised some question in the respect of uh, individual rights and whether there is still a role to play for the treaty and for the principle of proportionality so i think that the story has not ended here that there will be more case law which is ever evolving and quite complex also in the area of union citizenship but again time is running and i'm very much interested to hear the comments of the other members of the panel. So thank you very much. And uh, I give back the micro to you. 
Shuada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, in the interest of time, I, I will also skip the, the praise for the initiative and my pleasure of being here and go direct straight to the main points. Um, I, what I'm thinking of highlighting from the discussion that we've had are, are I, I will have essentially three main points on teaching, scholarship and practice, which were all issues that came up one way or the other. On teaching, uh, I would like to link the intervention by Inga Govara and and uh, growing in and, and growing in the work and Paul Craig's uh, um, conversation, which I find extremely stimulating, and the importance of reflecting on the on the objectives of teaching European law. I think that that is essential. This is something that Inga stressed quite a bit, not only in terms of approach, more static, more dynamic, but also what is it that we want uh, to. Uh, students to know about EU law. And this links to something that came out of the conversation between Gunya and Paul, which is also the need, I think, to rethink irrespective of, of the need with which I agree to keep a general EU course, but the, the need to reflect systematically to the extent that that is possible, and I'm not sure, on the position of teaching EU law in relation to national law. This is a point that I think Gunya raised and I think that this is a huge challenge because precisely of the fragmentation of EU law and how is, uh, I don't know, European banking law taught on finance, on, on, fi on corporate law courses, I don't know, right? And, and this links also to the first point on scholarship that I would like uh, to raise, which is also triggered by the conversation between uh, Paul and Grunia which is the extent to which it is, is it possible to identify the sectors in EU law. So not the topics such as rule of law or mutual trust that were mentioned in the conversation, but the sectors of EU law where that might influence the general evolution of EU law as a way of trying somewhat or, or trying, I'm not even sure if we should attempt to try to bridge the gap between the general and, and the specific, but in any event, to try to be able to keep a, a, a fit on both sides, which is, I think, increasingly, increasingly challenging. Um, still on the side of scholarship, I found the, the idea, uh, and, and Paul, please convey this to Grunia, the idea of a, a comparative law book on EU law, comparative EU law bringing in the richness of, of how law is European law is perceived in different member states extremely stimulating and, 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 and relevant and this links also to something that Monica just highlighted the, the it will stress the richness and plurality that exist in new law that I think are largely invisible still uh, to a great extent and I think that that would be an extremely relevant project to bring that richness and plurality to light. And the last point on scholarship is also triggered by something that Grunia said, which is she called attention to the importance of the critical turn uh, of EU legal studies. And something that worries me uh, is that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to know also what the others think about is, I think that there is a divide, a deep divide between the critical legal scholars of EU law and the other legal scholars of EU law. I don't know where this lies. I think that there is a, a, a divide in the sense that there is hardly ever a dialogue between these multiple views of the cathedral. And I think that it is crucial that there is a mute, a, a dialogue. We don't need to agree. That's obviously not the purpose, much on the contrary, but that there is an exchange among these multiple views of the cathedral, which, which I have not seen happening, or at least not as much as I think would be natural in periods such as this, or, or important in periods such as this. One last point to uh, on practice. Um, Paul Nihul's table in the beginning, I, I, I found it quite striking, I have to say, and very uh, uh, striking in one sense, because we're talking about unity and diversity. And what is showed very quickly there is that in 2023, we still have as the top uh, nationalities in contact with the court, both through legal secretaries, visits, but also judicially from the founding member states. 
and from two member states of the 1980s accession, with the exception of Portugal that I noted, obviously. So I, I find that is in 2023, when somewhat surprisingly, we still talk about the new member states of 2004, uh, something that, that needs to be tackled. <laughs> And 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 uh, I I'd be very curious. I know that he's not on the talk anymore in the talk anymore, but I'd be very curious to know what the court is doing uh, in that regard because that was the point of his presentation. Uh, but also to stress the importance between this internal composition of the court and internal workings of the court and the external world of EU law, right? And and and, and as this being another crucial area of interaction and further work in a period in which the court, as many have said here, has become much more relevant and, and extraordinarily relevant in highly sensitive areas, policy areas and areas of law. And with that, I close. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel. Okay. Well, th thank you very much for the invitation to, to be here and congratulations. Uh, I join with the, the, the choir of Congratulations on this magnificent project. Uh, just very quickly, two points, uh, and I think they have been tackled in one way or another uh, in the previous uh, presentations. First point on scholarship production, on scholarship uh, readership. And here I am fully supportive of Monica's concern about uh, the, the, the tsunami of literature that we have to handle as scholars, but also as practitioners, if a practitioner wants to uh, be up to date on where the debates are, he or she is also inundated with scholarship uh, and sometimes even contents which are not officially scholarship contents, but which might become from practitioners themselves. There is a tsunami of information, but at the same time, there is a matter of speed. EU law is running very fast. And the fact that the EU is becoming the leader of legislation is not making things easier. If you look at how member state legislators are legislating at the time, it's very obvious that they're quite passive most of the times awaiting EU legislation first, because they know that EU legislation will arrive. So let's just wait for EU legislation, then we'll legislate ourselves. So the EU is leading the way in legislation and is doing it quite fast as well. And if we compare it with the pace in which the EU legislated in the past, just look at the present commission and its track record. It's very, very impressive about this, not only the quantity, but also the, the, the speed at which it has been able to push through legislative initiatives and many more to come before this commission ends. So we have to deal with a lot and a lot very fast. Now, this leads us to an enormous amount of content to deal with in terms of studying subject matters, which are a lot and changing, and also the production that that ensues, the, the, the scientific production that that produces. And as an EU scholar, I think that although we have to face the reality of this abundance of, of elements to handle, when it comes to the actual production by scholars, I think we have to be realistic and eventually we need to limit ourselves to end up handling a selected number of sources from which to read. Now, <clears throat> inevitably, we are going to be confronted with new types of sources, which we will have to read. And those new sources might be the result of the speed with which we are at the moment. And that's why in a spontaneous way, the world of blogging became very important, because it was where in a quick context and at a relatively fast pace, we could find some quality, some non-quality, but at least we could find comment, opinion about recent developments. The world of blogging became a bit messy because it's not standardized, it's not regulated. It didn't exist for a very long time for scholarship purposes, but it was there. Um, I think we have reached a point in which that world in which fast contents must be somewhere is becoming to become a bit more structured. That is what Eagle Alive is about, is about structuring that world, which happens very fast, but complying with at least some minimum standards of quality, uh, some editorial review of content, some selection of content, some structure. But I think that we have to assume that we have to live with those new sources because they 
are able to produce quick analysis with a minimum standard of quality attached. Now, does that mean that traditional scholarship is in decline? Uh, no, not at all. It's, it's exactly the opposite, precisely because we have a lot of content. No matter how fast it's happening, we are still needing more than ever traditional scholarship, and we still need more than ever traditional journals. We need that work, and that has to take place. But here, my concern, and I will end my first point on this concern, is the point of bureaucratization. And here I believe that in the academic community, we are becoming extremely bureaucratized, probably in the interest of providing a level playing field for all academics. We have created and developed a system in which now we are ticking boxes in order to ensure a career. But ticking boxes means that we have to publish X publications in X scientific journals, X books in X uh, uh, publishing houses, and that is contributing to the exacerbation of the quantity of production that's out there, that's making it more and more difficult to handle. So I fear that bureaucratization, which has arrived at the university world in a very aggressive way, and we live with it, and we have to struggle with it as academics, is contributing to that proliferation of production, which is very difficult to follow, which ends up being quite counterproductive overall for us as, uh, as scholars. So it's a cycle in which I don't know how to get out of, but I think it's a cycle that should be concerning us all as readers, but also as producers of research, which is supposed to be quality research, but it's supposed to have an impact and it's supposed to be read. And I very much doubt the ability of our readers to read everything that's coming out, uh, even the quality production that is coming out. And at some point, we might need to reflect on that. My second uh, idea to be floated around is linked to some of the issues that have come up before and it's more related to EU law specifically. I, uh, I think that EU law, because of the very peculiar context in which it has evolved, and the very peculiar role that the Court of Justice has played, since the European project is an integration through law project, mostly, the EU basically, what it does is produce rules. It has become a very court-centered legal system, in the sense that it's a very court of justice, centered legal system and us as scholars we have devoted a very long time probably too much time reading judgments of the court and probably not ignoring but leaving at the secondary side the role of the legislator of the executive which is indeed extremely important in understanding the law uh, this all has explanations and it's perfectly legitimate but I do believe that we are in still in a paradigm of, e, of an EU law understanding, which is too close to an understanding of law as produced by not only courts, but by a single court, by the Court of Justice. And here I, 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 I'm very sensitive to the concerns that Paul Nimitz uh, shared with us about those comments of Brad Smith saying that it's going to be a court that's going to make us balancing analysis and not the legislature. To a certain extent, I think that most EU lawyers would agree with that analysis, not because that is the correct analysis, but because probably in our subconscious, when we talk about EU law, we're thinking eventually at some point that the Court of Justice will rule on that. And to a certain extent, that comment by Brad Smith is very extensible to the European practice because of that preeminence of the Court of Justice as, as, a, as a very important actor in the field. And that has an impact on scholarship, because we still are an academic community very, very, very close to what the court is doing, maybe too much. And to a certain extent, we might have to reconsider that court centered approach that we have all been involved in for many, many, many years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, all panel members. We uh, are running over. Um, so that means that, unfortunately, I don't think we can do the back and Forth, uh, between the speakers and the panelists in the way that we would have uh, imagined. Um, but as we can even see in the chats, uh, the participants also online, they are just happy about the quality that we have been getting uh, this whole morning. So um, I think uh, and I and Lawrence uh, join in that. Um, what we perhaps can do for the final two minutes is just pass the floor back to any of the speakers who would like to react to anything that the panel members have said. So um, if our fantastic ICT service could 
puts the cameras uh, of the speakers back in focus, then maybe the speakers can signal if there's anything they would like to uh, say in reply to the panel members. All right, so I'm seeing uh, indeed. Yes, uh, so Judge Safian, you would like to uh, react. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for, for this uh, very stimulating debate. Uh, few, few questions, few, few, few uh, very short observations. Um, the first one, uh, uh, what, uh, what is the adequate reaction uh, related to the complexity and the pressure of uh, EU law, uh, text, document, doctrine, and uh, uh, so complexity? The issues uh, in this field. Uh, I, I think that that uh, we we concentrate our debate especially on the uh, issues uh, related to the scholarship, the the concept of uh, uh, in, uh, of uh, academia and the the learning of uh, EU law. But uh, I would like to stress that we uh, cannot forget that uh, the one of the first. Uh, uh, in, uh, first uh, obligate duty of uh, uh, European lawyer is uh, uh, to have a good communication, the good communication with the citizens of EU. Uh, our product, our judgment, our uh, uh, articles are uh, uh, addressed not only, uh, should not be addressed, not only for um, uh, uh, for specialist ex expert, but uh, but also for uh, the average uh, citizen uh, who, in my view, uh, are not able to understand uh, even the uh, very basic elements of EU law. But uh, the the problem is uh, starting uh, from the perhaps the judgment of uh, uh, ECJ. Uh, I know that we are not. Uh, very clear, we are not very transparent in uh, our motivation. Perhaps the motivation is more and more uh, developed, but finally uh, it is uh, uh, at the same time uh, uh, more, more and more, more uh, complex and perhaps uh, 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 more, this is more hard to, 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 to be understood. Uh, the, second, the, the, the second remark. Uh, 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 second observation related the uh, uh, activity of the Court of Justice as the uh, uh, constitutional court because because I uh, if I, if I I I well understood the, the professor uh, professor uh, uh, Arnold uh, I think that the, uh, we we should uh, we should uh, identify precisely now. Uh, what is the main role of ECJ, uh, uh, taking into account this pressure, um, the uh, thousands of cases and uh, uh, so complexity of uh, uh, issues uh, uh, presented before before the court. I, I think that uh, the evolution of ECJ is clearly determined toward to the um, uh, constitutional function. The, uh, ECJ became more and more very constitutional court of EU, and it is the main main uh, activity in the future. And uh, if, if we follow all uh, reforms uh, uh, related uh, realized by um, uh, ECJ, uh, f f of course, uh, concluding uh, including this uh, last. Uh, um, reform um, the transfer of uh, uh, presidential references to the uh, tribunal. It is clear that uh, our uh, concept, our idea is uh, to concentrate uh, um, the case law on the main, most important uh, uh, issues. And the last remarks, I uh, I would like to 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 um, uh, 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 stress clearly that uh, perhaps uh, we uh, uh, of course we we need uh, uh, plurality uh, not only plurality uh, linguistic plurality we we need the plurality of our society and uh, uh, plurality uh, linguistic plurality 
uh, it's a necessary um, element to uh, to elaborate uh, a very good common legal language. We, we can better understood the um, issues uh, uh, related to the uh, to this uh, common legal language through the uh, dialogue with different uh, approaches represented by the different uh, uh, legal system. And it's absolutely necessary element uh, the, the concept of EU law for the future. And uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the end, uh, the really um, last uh, observation, I, I think that uh, we need, we need perhaps uh, the more uh, uh, active uh, uh, case law in the field of the protection of fundamental rights. In my view, it's absolutely necessary uh, to convince European citizens and uh, to, to, to construct very uh, 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 European citizenship through to the uh, uh, development of very effective protection of fundamental rights. And perhaps it is a, a lot of to, to do for ECJ, for the future, for, for the case law. I know. And we, 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 should, we should decide uh, for the future uh, to um, uh, admit uh, more, uh, um, uh, more um, active, more, 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 more open uh, approach uh, to uh, allow uh, 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 such effective protection of uh, fundamental rights of citizens. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for, for, for perhaps uh, to be too, uh, uh, too long. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Judge. That was extremely insightful uh, and uh, intriguing as well. Um, I think, Paul Craig, you would like to uh, add something. Please go ahead. Thank you, Sasha. My comments very, very quick. I know that time is pressing. I thought that the Comments from the panels were really interesting and um, and incisive. I just have one um, thought in the light of something that Joanna said. Um, I very much share Joanna's feeling that the kind of we're getting to a stage where there's slightly two worlds out there. Um, you know, kind of if you like the mainstream but still critical uh, um, scholars of EU law and a more radical, just in a descriptive sense, not in it, not in any, not in it, not connoting anything else, a group of scholars. I think here's an idea. Why don't you, Sasha, with Inga, in one of your books for heart, here's an idea I think would be really interesting. Construct a book where you take a set of key topics, okay, get a scholar, you know, for want of a better term, a mainstream scholar, but someone who's still critical of the EU, and then someone with more radical scholar, get them to talk about the same topic, all right? Same topic. And not just talk past each other. They've got to swap texts beforehand and respond, okay? Um, we will do that. Uh, we just froze your, your image froze there, Paul. I don't know if you can still hear us and see us, but uh, thank you for that wonderful suggestion. Um, we have, I think, been inspired by many uh, suggestions for, for further work for further directions in, in scholarship, in teaching. Uh, Inga, I saw you raise your hand. Would you also like to come in on that um, briefly as the almost I can just v very, very briefly, and of course, I would like to take a poll, but then perhaps with his collaboration also, but we can discuss that later. Um, but I also thought that the comments were very insightful also of the panel uh, and, and sort of the one point that, that is really crucial, uh, which emerges is, is the sheer quantity, of course, of the sources. Um, which we have at our disposal now, but also the, the decreasing quality. Uh, or at least the decreasing um, reliance that we can have on the quality control at the source of the sources being written and being offered to us scholars, but also to the general public. And I think that necessitates uh, much more 
in a new uh, digital setting much more than before the awareness that we need to have a critical analytical view of European law, not just in substance, uh, of what the court is doing, what the legislator is doing, of each other's work, but also about the methodologies that we are using. And that is why it's so important. I mean, all of us know that because we have been uh, educated in a, in a different world where we could still rely more on sources and we have seen that transformation. So we are aware of it. The youngsters are not. They live in a totally different reality than we do. So I think it is very important to continue a critical analytical study of EU law also through the younger generations and for the future that we tackle this issue head on of how to make sure that we can deal in a critical analytical manner also with the methodologies that are developing now and in the future. Um, that being said, we can do that for ourselves and for the youngsters who are interested in EU law and also there we may have the two sides, as was said, and the two sides looking at the cathedral in a different manner. But the biggest challenge, I think, for us scholars and practitioners of EU law will indeed be to bridge the gap or to become aware of the fact that the general public and the citizens of the European Union may not have that same critical analytical view of EU law and in particular of the methodologies and the sources that are being offered. So if we do not want the European Union to have a further growing apart from its citizens, uh, I think a big challenge that we have to consider as uh, scholars and practitioners of EU law is how to bridge that gap and not just among us who may have different views and different methodologies, but it is to talk to the general public and to instill that. And I'm not sure how we can do that currently. We're thinking about it. Another thing to think about. So I think we will have to leave it here. We could probably go on for hours. Uh, we are all enjoying ourselves very much. At least I'm enjoying myself very much. Um, I thank everyone uh, on behalf of Lawrence and myself for uh, having participated. The recording will be available on EU Law Live. Thank you very much, Danielle, for that. Um, and of course, I hope that you will spread the word about our encyclopedia and also uh, invite anyone uh, to be become involved because we've always wanted the encyclopedia to be something of a shared product, shared resource, shared experience for the whole EU legal community in all its magnificent plurality and diversity. Um, and so let's let's try to uh, to carry it forward that way. Lawrence, maybe the final words to you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Yes, can I just endorse that wholeheartedly. The encyclopedia itself will grow organically, uh, rather like EU, EU law, it will probably grow and grow and grow. Uh, and I, I think I hope it will be a very good uh, vehicle for people to develop new ideas, uh, make critical um, critical comments known, but also place them um, in the uh, in, in 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 context. In a, in, a, in a good and scholarly way. So thank you very much indeed. We hope to see some of you perhaps this afternoon in the second half of the, of the webinar. And uh, let's all wish each other a successful continuation of the, uh, um, of the project. And we're very grateful to you and the advisory board for everything that you've done for us so far. Please continue. Thank you.